Well, good morning, everyone. It's an absolute honour to be here talking about climate change with you all and on a panel of such superstars. So next to me here, we have Anna Rose. And Anna Rose is the Strategic Projects Director of Farmers for Climate Action. She is also a governor of WWF Australia, author of the book Madlands, A Journey to Change the Mind of a Climate Skeptic, and co-starred in an ABC documentary, I Can Change Your Mind on Climate Change. And next to Anna, we have Danny. Danny, all the way from the US, and she is a world-renowned researcher, speaker, and advocate on all issues relating to food systems and agriculture. And in 2013, Danny co-founded a not-for-profit organization called Food Tank. Next to Danny, we have Sarah, and Sarah has two decades of experience as a corporate lawyer and is regarded as one of the world's foremost experts on investment governance and corporate disclosures, issues relating to climate change. And we have Rachel, Dr. Rachel Carey, who is a lecturer of food systems in the Faculty of Veterinary and Agricultural Sciences at the University of Melbourne. So this morning, we are setting out to disrupt climate change because all of us here know that if we are going to produce affordable, nutritious food for everyone at the global table, we have to change the status quo. We have an environment that is screaming out that something is wrong. And we have people on the front line, the farmers, saying that business as usual is no longer an option. Climate change is impacting land, our communities, and our livelihoods. Now, last month, the International Panel on Climate Change released its latest report on land degradation, desertification, and greenhouse gas fluxes from e terrestrial ecosystems. And it had three key messages. That land, agriculture, and food systems are under growing human pressure. Secondly, that land and land managers are an important part of the solution in combating climate change. But thirdly, land and agriculture can't do it all. So we're going to structure this morning's talk in a similar manner in that we're going to first set the scene on how climate change is disrupting food and farming systems, and then we're going to be forward-looking. We're going to look at the solutions, because it is so often easier to point out the problems, the challenges, and we don't leave enough room to talk about the solutions that are actually already out there. But we need to get them implemented, and we need that done in an effective, timely manner. So before we start talking about who needs to do what and where, we're going to set the scene. And Danny, I was hoping that you, I could start with you because you've been working all over the world and no doubt you have met uh, smallholders, subsistence farmers to you know, these high-tech, high-producing, state-of-the-art food facilities. And although at times these seem world apart um, in the way they produce food and what they produce, there are common threads with climate change, the challenges that are impacting these people who are producing the food. So I was wondering if you could set the scene in why climate change is such an important topic for agriculture and why it's become such a central theme of Food Tank. Absolutely, and thank you. It's so wonderful to see Seeds and Chips here in, in Melbourne. Uh, I've been attending the Milan uh, summits for, for a long time now, so I'm so glad that this has come here. And I think your, your question is such an important one. Why, why is climate change so central to agriculture? And I think, you know, it's, it's really one of the, the most affected industries or sectors by, by agriculture, and also the, the, uh, the industry that can really do the most to, to help mitigate and adapt to climate change. Farmers are already doing things all over the world. You know, I've had this incredible opportunity to really travel to 70 plus countries at this point, listening to hundreds and hundreds of farmers and farmers groups and scientists and, and you know, people like the women on this stage who are doing incredible things to, to help uh, restore the food system. And, and what I've sort of heard and, and, and seen from them is that 
There are so many challenges, obviously, but there are also so many solutions. And, and we often look to the global north, you know, whether it's Australia or the United States or, or Europe, for the solutions, and when in fact many of the solutions are, are on the ground in the developing world, women and men who are you know, fighting climate change by uh, growing tr crops along with trees through agroforestry, using regenerative practices, you know, using vermiculture and uh, other uh, techniques that can help uh, restore soils. And so I think it's just a, an incredible way to understand that we don't always, you know, as, as experts have all the answers. Sometimes the answers are really literally in fields and kitchens uh, around the world. Yum. And agriculture holds such an interesting position in the topic of climate change because farmers are, you know, at the front line. They're some of the hardest hit by the impacts of changing weather patterns and higher, higher temperatures, lower rainfalls. We're also an incredibly important part in the solution, as you say, but we're also a big contributor to the problem. And Rachel, I was wondering if I could bring you in here. What is the evidence telling us about how the food system contributes to climate change? Sure. Well, look, the evidence is telling us that the food system overall contributes around a quarter to a third of human-induced greenhouse gas emissions. That's clearly quite a significant um, issue. We also know, of course, that the food system is going to be impacted by climate change. So we're expecting different parts of the world to be affected in different ways. But we do know that overall, we're likely to see yields of crops reducing, and that we're likely to see more volatile food prices, and that overall, we're likely to see food prices increasing as global food systems are more affected by the shocks and stresses related to, related to climate change. Um, and I think overall what some of that evidence is telling us is that if we want to address the greenhouse gas emissions from the food system, then we need to be adopting a multi-pronged approach, that there is no one silver bullet or kind of one magic lever that we can crank. I think the evidence tells us quite clearly that we need to be acting on multiple fronts so that we need to be changing the way that we produce food, but that we also need to be changing the way that we consume food as well, and that we need to be reducing the greenhouse gas emissions from food waste too. So really, I think the evidence is telling us quite strongly that we will want to see action on multiple fronts if we're going to um, keep global warming to 1.5 degrees. And if changes of the food system are going to contribute to that, then we will need to see multiple different kinds of action. Yeah. Sarah, you talk about a climate evolution of a challenge that has moved away from an environmental issue to a financial issue. And farmers really understand this because they feel the impacts of climate change in their wallets. So can you tell me about the financial risk of climate change and what categories of risk need to be considered? Thanks, of course. Um, I'm a corporate lawyer. So I don't care about farming communities or the environment or any of that malarkey. I care about money. <laughs> and so I've seen over the last few years a stark evolution in mainstream corporate and investor attitudes on climate change, recognising that this just isn't a lefty, hippie, greeny socialist issue. This has key financial risks and opportunities that need to be managed. And the agricultural sector is, of course, on the front lines of both the risks and the opportunities. So we tend to use the framework that was first uh, promulgated by Mark Carney, who's the governor of the Bank of England back in 2015. He did a very important speech called The Tragedy of the Horizon at Lloyd's of London. Uh, and, and in that speech, he talked about three categories of financial risk associated with climate change. The first being the physical risks, so the ecological impacts that we ordinarily think about, whether they're gradual onset or acute catastrophic, an increase in acute catastrophic events, even with the 1.1 degrees centigrade of warming that we already have baked into the system, let alone if we hit four degrees by the end of the century. But then he went on to talk about a new concept that he called economic transition risks. Now, these are the responses of the real economy and financial markets to the risks and opportunities associated with climate change. So not the actual environmental impacts themselves. So they in turn have three categories. The first being policy and regulatory responses associated with climate change, like the carbon tax that we in Australia had and then didn't have. 
like, for example, New Zealand's zero carbon law, which also includes a, a target of reducing biogenic methane in their livestock sector by 43% by 2050. Second category, technological developments associated with climate change. So things like the increasing competitiveness of renewable energy technologies, electric cars, battery storage, that kind of thing. Again, you know, that's not the World Wildlife Fund coming up with a solution to save the planet. This is money grubbers in a capitalist society trying to make a buck over a problem that they see needs solving. And then the final category is shifts in stakeholder preferences. And that, to me, in the last couple of years has been on such an amazing trajectory. So if you think even things like single-use plastics, how quickly community attitudes to single-use plastics have changed in the last 12 months. Mm. You know, 12 months ago, people would have just gone to Woolies and got their single-use plastic bags and they might, you know, use them as bin liners, about as upcycle as they got. But now... You can't. And of course, a lot of that is being driven by millennials. But then at the other end of the spectrum, the old crusty end, the institutional investors who control the money, they are also very concerned about climate change because they understand that they're not going to continue to make money out of the companies in their portfolio unless those companies themselves can adapt to a low carbon future and to the physical risk impacts associated with climate change. And then the third category of risk that Mark Carney talked about was litigation risks associated with climate change. And so these are the risks that companies, that governments will be sued because of their failure to manage either the physical risks or the economic risks associated with climate change. So it's very much squarely evolved to being a risk that is financial. Yeah, and I guess planning going forward based on the, those historical norms is not good planning, that we actually have to really be looking at those projections that, are, you know, what are they telling us so we reduce those exposures to the agricultural industry? Absolutely, and I'm sure many of you in this room would have read the other Royal Commission report, not into the banking sector but into the Murray-Darling Basin and the management of water flows in, in, in the Murray-Darling Basin. Um, it was an absolute excoriation of the Murray-Darling Basin Authority's failure to take climate-related risks into account when uh, determining what the irrigation versus environmental flows should be. And the uh, Royal Commissioner came out and said that they were grossly negligent, they were incompetent, was indefensible um, on three levels. First, in dismissing the science associated with climate change as kind of an inconvenience that they could push to one side. Secondly, by assuming that they could wait until their next 10-year strategic planning cycle to consider climate as an element in their uh, calculations. And thirdly, by using uh, 162 years worth of historical data from CSIRO rather than those mm. uh, forward-looking projections when determining um, the impacts. So more and more there is a recognition not only that our planning scheme but the way in which administrative decisions are being made is just not fit for purpose. Yeah. Anna, you and I are both board directors for an amazing group called Farmers for Climate Action. I was wondering if you could tell the audience why a group like this felt the need it had to, to come together to form. Well, as everyone has said, farmers are right at the front line of climate change and that is particularly the case in Australia but also can be part of the solutions. And I come from a farming family on my mum's side and so a group of people that you know we met and um, farmers that we knew were concerned about climate change just got really sick of seeing particularly our rural political representatives who are meant to be the ones standing up for the interests of farmers, consistently dismissing the science of climate change and not standing up for farmers' best interests, which is to act on climate change and to make progress on these solutions that can help farmers both adapt to the impacts that are happening now, but also be part of the solution by reducing emissions in agriculture. 
So we started with a really small group of farmers. Um, Anika was one of them in the lead up to the UN climate talks in Paris four years ago. And today we are a movement of 5,000 farmers and graziers around Australia um, with 15,000 urban supporters as well. So people who've come through farming backgrounds and now work in other industries. And our farmers want to be part of solutions both behind the farm gate on their own properties, but also beyond the farm gate to participate in the political conversations and the economic conversations about climate change, which often don't feature people who are on the front line of it. Mm -hmm. And so we work across four areas. The first one is to increase the uptake of climate smart agriculture in Australia. The second is to accelerate the energy transition happening in rural and regional communities away from fossil fuels and towards renewable energy in a way that benefits farmers in rural communities. The third one is to shift Australia's broader agricultural sector on climate, which traditionally has had its head in the sand about climate risk. And we've actually seen so much progress in this area over the last few years with big policy shifts from the National Farmers Federation, New South Wales Farmers, um, United Dairy Farmers Victoria, the Victorian Farmers Federation, and even more recently, um, the Victorian National Party. So we're focusing on shifting the whole sector um, and then lastly, we focus on trying to change hearts and minds when it does come to those rural and regional, usually conservative politicians, because they do not need to be hearing from climate change from inner city, you know, latte sipping Melbourne lefties. They need to be <laughs> hearing about it from, from farmers. And so all of our farmers are doing things on farm, but also really politically active in trying to get a transformative change in the way our politicians deal with this issue. Thank you. Yeah, Farmers for Climate Action is just doing such incredible work. And on that topic of changing attitudes and practices, Danny, we know that climate change, poverty and gender are such interlinked issues. From your observations in sub-Saharan Africa and elsewhere, how are women in particular actually ditching cultural norms to protect families and the places they love in the face of climate change? Sure. Before I answer that, can I comment of course. On, on two things? So I, I, what, Sarah made such a, a, an interesting point and a really important one that, you know, last year no one would have been uh, interested in, in this topic of single-use plastics. Since I have, you know, started in this field 15, 18 years ago now, I've seen so much change. If you had asked me when I first started out in, in sustain, really the sustainable agriculture sector, if I'd ever be working with companies, I would have told you you were crazy and I would have used uh, you know, some spicier language than that to tell you that. Um, and, and I think it's so interesting that you know, Food Tank works with a number of companies. We don't accept corporate funding, but we work with a lot of companies who are doing interesting things. And, and really realizing that they're not demons always, that they need to be brought to the table, that they shouldn't be villainized in the same way that the sustainable agriculture movement can't be villainized. So I think there's a lot of interesting ways to, to understand where companies come into the picture. Um, and I also want to comment on, on what Anna had to say about uh, the, the importance of farmers mobilizing, farmers unions, farmers organizations all over the world are so important for pushing these, uh, these issues forward, whether it's climate change or, you know, women's rights or youth empowerment. These are all things that farmers groups have a lot of say in. In the United States, we have the Nas uh, National Young Farmers Coalition, and it's working to help... Uh, young farmers who are just starting out, who don't always come from farming families, find ways to support uh, you know, their farms and one another. Uh, in the United States, there's lots of student loan debt, working to forgive that student loan debt because these young farmers are helping preserve the environment and protecting the land. You know, they, they face a lot of challenges, but this interest from millennials uh, to get back into the food system is so inspiring, so that can't be ignored. Mm -hmm. And to get back to your point about gender, you know, I've seen so many inspiring women, you know, in places like Niger, which is one of the poorest countries in the world, and, and one of the most affected by drought. And I was able to meet with a group of women who had started their own cooperative. Um, and before they started the cooperative and were farming together, growing um, a lot of perennial crops, you know, fruits and vegetables, um, and, and trees, uh, they made about a dollar per day. Um, and, and 
after you know about a year or two of, of belonging to the cooperative, they were making about two thousand U.S. dollars uh, annually, which was a lot more than what they were making mm -hmm. before. Still, not you know not what all of us are making in this room. But it wasn't just that they were working to um, solve climate change by using things like solar drip irrigation and you know uh, growing crops that are really resilient. They were working to improve their, their lives and, and their households and, and really setting examples for not only the girls and their families, but also the boys. And that's a really important point when we're talking about gender equality and women's empowerment. We need to start educating men and boys about these issues as well. That's how cultural norms and mores get changed. It's when men are brought to the table and they work with women to, to solve these problems. So I, you know, I could share dozens of examples of cool women's groups I've met with, but I, I think that the point is that when we ignore women, we ignore them at our own peril because they make up about half of the agricultural labor force in the world and yet they lack the same resources that men do. So we really need to make sure that they have education, that they have extension services, that they have the inputs that they need and the education they need to be successful. Yeah, wonderful. No, that, that, that group collective action is, is so important. And, you know, the old saying that, you know, you only go so far alone, but together we can go so much further. Rachel, with your work with urban farmers and peri-urban farmers, I was wondering, are you... Are you also seeing, you know, different groups coming together and working collaboratively in these quite different environments from what Danny was describing there in sub-Saharan Africa? And what adaptation strategies you are seeing in those urban and semi uh, peri-urban farming systems? Yeah, absolutely. So we are certainly seeing farmers coming together um, and working together on projects where they are adapting to the circumstances that they're facing currently in a warming climate. One of the things in this part of the world, of course, um, is that we're in a drying climate. We've had significant issues in terms of um, drought. And so one of the benefits, of course, of keeping some food production close to cities is that there are really important waste streams in cities that can be used to produce food and to counter some of these effects of climate change. We can see them a bit like a buffer or an insurance policy against some of the shocks and stresses that we're likely to face. So one of those um, particularly important waste streams is access to recycled water. So of course cities produce huge amounts of wastewater. The bigger the city gets, the more wastewater that city produces. And of course the bigger the city gets, the more stormwater runoff we have as well. Now they're both really important important sources of water that may become some of the more important, more, more secure sources of water in the future to produce food. So it may be, for instance, in the Murray-Darling Basin system that no matter how many efficiency measures we put in place, that we actually do need to move some of the more water-intensive production back to the fringes of cities where we have access to recycled water that can be used to produce mm -hmm. food. Now, at the moment, we use relatively little of that recycled water. So on the Food Print Melbourne project, some, a research project I was leading, we found that in 2015, 16, only around 6% of the recycled water produced by Melbourne's two main water treatment plants were actually used to produce food. In fact, only around 10% was used at all. Around 84% is being recycled mostly to Class A water that could be being used to produce food, but is actually being discharged at sea rather than being used for any productive purpose. So we have to start to think about how we're going to adapt to um, a warming, um, particularly drying climate, and how we're going to use these really important waste sources. Another important waste source, of course, would be organic waste and food waste. Cities generate a lot of organic waste and food waste that could be recycled and then um, basically put back onto farm, keeping those really important nutrients in the food system as well. So we can start to think about you know, how we can um, develop circular food systems at that city scale. And we're starting to see coalitions of farmers who are coming together and who are advocating for more recycled water projects to um, be ensuring that they have access to water during periods of drought. Yeah, those cyclical systems just make so much sense. I mean, we really do have to recycle and revalue those natural resources, especially in such a water-scarce country like Australia. Sarah, I saw you taking some notes. Did you have something you wanted to add there? No, I was oh, actually okay. writing down something <laughs> Dr. Rachel said that I hadn't thought of before, which is, um, and actually something you didn't talk about, I suppose the the co-circularities involved with 
urban access to the agricultural waste in terms of, you know, biofuel and all that kind of thing mm. and proximity to the cities for transport and blah, blah, blah. So, no, I was learning. Wonderful. Well, while you've got the mic, <laughs> I would love to know... Um, you know, we hear a lot about the economic transition that is currently underway and, you know, that, that is needed for a sustainable and productive future. And I was wondering if you could walk us through some policy or regulatory responses that you are seeing taking place in Australia and uh, are these different at different levels also? Um, yes. Well, we've, of course, got a really progressive, fabulous centralised energy policy in Australia <laughs> that's... No. Um, <laughs> It's interesting, in Australia, um, it's interesting to contrast Australia to the New Zealand approach. New Zealand, of course, has always had predominantly renewable energy sources and business has never had to take the lead over there because the government always has. Whereas over here in Australia, the lead is really being taken by asset owners in particular, large institutional investors, um, and the business community more broadly, and particularly in the ag sector, where there's multi-generational businesses um, who understand inter intergenerational equity, a lot going on in the wine sector, actually, because of the fact that they're so susceptible to, to temperature changes. But in terms of regulatory developments in Australia, it, it, it's actually quite exciting what's been happening even in the last 12 months, where... Um, all our corporate regulators have come out and said, this is a financial risk issue for business. We are going to be administering the corporate laws in a way that recognises that it is a financial risk issue. And most recently, just last month, ASIC, the Australian Securities and Investments Commission, that regulates companies and, and their directors, came out and said, in your annual reports, you need to disclose in accordance with the recommendations of the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures, which is the voluntary, though not anymore, uh, framework that the G20 Financial Stability Board uh, promulgated after the Paris Agreement for companies to assess and disclose material financial risks associated with climate change. And the key recommendation in that is that business does forward-looking stress testing and scenario analysis across a pl plausible range of climate futures, including the well below two degrees scenario set out in the Paris Agreement. So now, in Australia, listed companies will be obliged in their annual reports to disclose that information. And the Accounting Standards Board and Auditing Standards Board has also updated their guidance to say to companies, OK, well, you need to connect the dots between that narrative disclosure that you're making in your annual reports to the balance sheet, to the numbers in the financial report. And you have to articulate in the notes of the financial statements what your assumptions are in relation to climate change going forwards, what your central case is, and how that has impacted on the valuations of your assets and liabilities in your balance sheet. And if there are other assumptions that are still reasonable that would lead to materially different numbers, you have to disclose that too. So in Australia, all of a sudden, we've leapt to the top in terms of the, and I know this isn't a word, but I like it anyway, the degree of onerosity that companies face in terms of the expectation of how they assess and disclose climate-related financial risks. And business is not ready for that. Mm. And they are going to get slammed. Yep. Anna, you were saying earlier that one of the, the primary reasons that Farmers for Climate Action formed and this group of farmers from right around the country and all these different industries came together is because we weren't seeing the, the leadership from our elected representatives who were saying that, you know, um, they care for the land and the farming industry, uh, but there was then a lack of anything happening on the climate change front. So we came together. Farmers for Climate Action is now calling for a national strategy on climate change and agriculture to, I guess, fill that gap. Why is it important that we have this national coordinated approach in the agricultural sector? There's only so much that farmers can do on their own, on their own farm, without policy support um, and funding as well from state and federal governments. 
And back when the last big strategy process was done for Australian agriculture, we had a green paper and a white paper process when Barnaby Joyce was our federal agriculture minister. There was no mention of climate change in that process at all. So that means that the Federal Agriculture Department can't incorporate climate into its work because it hasn't come from that policy level from the minister. So we have been working with state governments and uh, with Minister Littleproud when he was the previous agriculture minister. He's now drought minister and we have a new Federal Agriculture Minister um, to prosecute the case that we need a national strategy to help farmers reduce emissions in agriculture and also to help farmers adapt to the climate changes that are already happening and that are already locked in to build resilience. Mm. Um, So we talk about climate smart agriculture as practices that help reduce emissions and help build resilience to climate change. And often they are similar things like, you know, not land clearing and increasing vegetation and looking after your soil and being smarter with how you use water. So we were actually successful in getting AGMIN, which is the forum where all the state and federal agriculture ministers make joint policy, to agree, um, they passed a motion um, to agree to have a national strategy on climate change and agriculture. And that work is now being taken forward by the Victorian Agriculture Department. And it will be discussed at AGMIN's next meeting with all the um, federal and state ag ministers before the end of the year. Uh, And we actually have a big group of 20 or 30 farmers going to Canberra in a couple of weeks to talk to members of parliament and the department about what we want to see in that strategy. And some of you will be aware that there's a great project happening um, by Climate Works, a really good um, think tank about how we can reduce emissions in agriculture in Australia. We're looking forward to the results of that and hoping that they'll be incorporated into this national strategy. But that's certainly going to be a really important piece of policy that will affect um, state and federal level um, funding and legislation. Yeah, wonderful. Danny, you're part of a group called the Refresh Group, which is examining the intersection of technological innovation and the US food system through research, storytelling, collective action, and I'm not sure if policy comes into there um, or not. But to me, it sounds like this group really knows that farmers can't do it alone, that we need to, well, we can't be working in silos, that we need to be engaging people from all sectors, from all parts of society. So I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about the work with the Refresh Group and what it's hoping to achieve. Sure. So the Refresh Working Group, its idea is to refresh the food system and really look at how technology can both help and hinder uh, farmers, uh, you know, in in their daily lives and and help them either do their jobs better or or make it more uncomfortable for them. And this was organized, uh, and and I want to give this uh, company kudos for doing this by Google and and the Swell Creative Group. And Google's taking on a big sort of risk here because they understand that they're going to be criticized by a lot of people who are part of Refresh. Uh, I'm one of them, you know, who's often critical of of looking at technology as a silver bullet. It's not. It can be helpful to farmers. But the group is really made up of interesting people, a lot of women, a lot of women um, tech entrepreneurs, a lot of women farmers. Um, There are also uh, men and young people who are working in different sectors. And I think, again, by bringing all of these groups together, who are not just farmers, but people involved in agriculture, that's how you build that collective action for moving forward on agriculture. We all eat, right? And we all vote and and we have to have sort of a say in in what the food system looks like. And uh, Refresh right now is developing a letter, sort of an open letter to the 2020 presidential candidates. You know, next year is a big year for the United States in so many ways. And so what we haven't heard from a lot of um, our, both our elected officials and our, you know, the candidates who are running for president, they don't talk about agriculture. Mm-hmm. I, I remember watching one of the debates uh, over um, the summer in the United States, and uh, one of the candidates said, "Soil," and I was so excited, like I left off, left, like you know, left off my couch. So I think that there's a need for. Uh, policymakers to know more about agriculture. That's what Refresh is trying to do on mm-hmm. some level. Also trying to educate the tech sector and the financial and, and corporate sector so that they know that you know if, if they're not paying attention now, 
the, you know, they'll pay for it later. So I think it's, it's really the power of, of coming together that can change these things. Mm. Rachel, who do you think we need to be working with in the agricultural sector to ensure that accessibility and affordability of food in our cities, in this you know, growing global world that we're living in? Actually, before I pick up on that, I might yeah. just go back to a point, if I sure. can, that um, Anna Rose was making previously also about um, the importance of government leadership in this space. And you know, we started off by saying that action was needed on multiple fronts. And we've heard that there's, um, there's policy development train, which is absolutely fantastic to look at a strategy um, for climate change in, in agriculture. And we also have a national food waste strategy that's being developed at the moment, which is also a fantastic initiative in terms of reducing the greenhouse gas emissions from food waste. There's a third kind of missing piece to this, I think, which is also really important that we start to see government leadership in. And that's in helping people to understand how we all need to change the way that we eat so we can bring the food system back within planetary boundaries um, again and to see what I'd really like to see is some more government leadership in that space as well. So at the moment, I guess the default policy approach really says that it's, it's up to us as, as consumers and as eaters to shape the food system so that, it's, um, so that it has less impact on the environment. But without clear advice from government about what it is that consumers should actually do in order to shape the food system that way. How is it that we need to eat in order to bring the food system back within planetary boundaries? So I think there's a missing piece to all this where we're not seeing enough government action at the moment yeah. and where I think we really should be seeing government action at all levels, um, national and state and also cities as well. We had a failed attempt to do this in Australia back in 2013. Um, and I think that that's just a really important missing piece of this, if you like. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely so important to have that leadership from the top. But I do think that, yeah, equally as important, having people on the ground, you know, on the farm, yeah, yeah, taking is. action too. Um, Anna, I, I have heard you talk about um, time, treasure and talent, you know, that individuals can actually do so much and, you know, cause a groundswell and, you know, drive that action as Farmers for Climate Action has done. Could you just briefly talk about time, treasure, and talent? There is so much that we can all do to tackle climate change, yep. um, both with our decisions around food and our participation in the food system, but also in our everyday lives. And so these are three dimensions of three <laughs> dimensions of thinking about how we can all be part of it. One is, what are the organisations that we can give our time to, to be involved in supporting. Um, and there are so many when it comes to sustainable agriculture and climate change. This is one of the biggest movements, like social movements, that the world has ever seen. Uh, and that's why it's really exciting to be part of the huge transformation that's happening in this area. Um, the second is your talent. Like, what are you good at? What are the networks that you have, the skills that you have that you can lend to this transition and to help make progress on these issues? And the, the last is your treasure. Like all of these organisations that are doing great work all need financial support. So how can you as an individual or the organisations that you're part of help accelerate this? And I think uh, actually listening to you all talk, I just um, had this little thought bubble pop up, which was from Bill McKibben, who is a friend of mine who's also a climate campaigner in the United States. And he says, the most important question that's ever been asked throughout history is what's for dinner? And that is going to become increasingly harder to answer mm -hmm. as these climate risks and shocks start hitting us even more. And at the moment, it's farmers that are feeling mm -hmm. it, you know, the most in Australia, but that is going to trickle down through to the availability and the affordability of the food that we all eat. So, you know, ultimately, as you said, we all eat food. This is not just an agriculture issue. This is a human civilization mm -hmm. issue. Yeah, a lot of it seems so sort of common sense, like w we need to get here. And in many instances, we, we've got the pathway, the roadmap, the technologies available. Sarah, I was wondering if you could um, tell us what do you think are the, the major roadblocks stopping us from getting there? What is actually preventing us from disrupting climate change in the way that is necessary at this point? I'm trying to think of a way to put that diplomatically. <laughs> I know this is difficult 
coming from a lawyer, but can I talk about an opportunity rather than a, sure. than a barrier? I know. <laughs> um, because I really wanted to make sure that I did have the opportunity to show everyone the slide that we've been Absolutely. talking about. Could you put the slide up on the screen? Um, I was talking about before the fact that uh, institutional investors have started to take notice of climate change as a financial risk issue and that going forward every listed company is going to be obliged to publish their stress testing and scenario planning under the TCFD framework. This is a page from the Commonwealth Bank's annual report released a fortnight ago. Not a sustainability report or anything like that, it's annual report. And you can see up there there's three sets of charts, one for grains, one for livestock, one for dairy, where CBA, our largest bank, has done its analysis of the revenue earning potential, the profitability potential for Australian farms in those sectors out to 2060 under a stressed climate scenario with no adaptation. And it's difficult to see there on the screen, but the brown tends down to minus 50% in terms of profitability in that first row. The second row shows what the profitability potential is for those same farms if they proactively adapt. It's a hell of a lot more green, which indicates a positive profitability potential. Now, how does that impact on you? Well, it's interesting, being led out of Europe at the moment, there are, um, all the banks over there are starting to adjust their interest rates to commercial lenders based on whether or not those borrowers behave sustainably or otherwise. And linking margin adjustments, so interest rate adjustments up or down every year, depending on whether the borrowers hit or miss predetermined sustainability targets, which are negotiated with a bank by reference to, well, what are the financial, material, sustainability drivers for this business? So, for example, Danone has a 2 billion euro sustainability linked loan where its interest rate gets adjusted by three basis points up or down every year, depending on whether or not it hits its sustainability targets. Things like um, targeting net zero in its processing operations, but also working with farmers upstream to reduce their emissions and embed uh, regenerative agricultural practices. Same with Bell, same with Barry Calibut, same with Olam and Wilmar in Asia. So that is the next frontier here in Australia. It's something that our banks have been quite slow to get on. What are the risks and benefits associated with climate change to your business, to your farm? And how can you leverage your proactive addressing of those risks and opportunities into lowering your cost of capital? Because increasingly, if you don't, it is going to be more expensive for you to borrow if you can borrow at all, let alone getting insurance on your property as well. So I think, to go back to your original question about barriers, um, you know, Australia, we are, a, we are a backwater on this. It's embarrassing whenever I go to Europe. Um, you know, they've stopped having a debate about whether or not climate change was a thing 20 years ago. Their whole financial system is set up around it. Their energy system is, is well and truly transitioned. But the money hopefully will save us because we're now of their own volition having financial institutions doing things like that where they understand that they need to price these risks in. Can I ask, do you think that the potential to have different interest rates for, for farmers who are doing more sustainable practices could, it, could be the, the solution to cracking our deforestation and land clearing crisis in Australia? I think it's certainly an important part. Certainly an important part. And the banks are looking for opportunities in this area, actively looking. They've only done three so far in Australia and they've all been airports. And the sustainability criteria, quite frankly, are pretty uninspiring. Bit of low hanging fruit, you know, a few solar panels, more efficient air conditioning, electric buses. So um, the banks get it. They want you to be in the green bit, not the brown bit, because otherwise, they're not going to get their money back. 
Thank you, Sarah. Uh, does anyone have anything else to add? Otherwise, I will hand over to Cal and we'll open up for questions from the floor. All right. Oh, Thank you. Oh, great. Um, so for those who don't know, um, on the app, you can um, ask questions uh, to the panel. Um, so if you just go to this session, uh, you, can, you can ask any question. Um, and then I'll do my best to triage and mash them all into lumpy questions to, to cover them all. Uh, if you just make sure, if you want to ask a question to a particular panellist, uh, that you just mention that in the question. Um, the first one that's come through is, is just around um, R&D uh, and where we should focus our R&D dollars for maximum impact. Um, maybe, Rachel, we might kick off with you. Um, that's a really interesting question, R&D dollars for maximum impact. And I think it probably goes back to sort of what I said before in terms of what the evidence is saying that we need to be acting on multiple fronts. So I think I'm going to have to say that um, there's multiple areas that we would um, want to put that, uh, those R&D funds in for maximum um, impact in terms of where those greenhouse gas emissions are coming from. I think we're looking at food waste, we're looking at the livestock sector particularly, um, and I think that there's, we'd certainly like to see a lot more R&D dollars in those areas. I think looking at alternative protein supply chains as well, as how we can make um, those livestock sectors um, more efficient and reduce the greenhouse gas emissions from those sectors. Um, I, I do think, though, the answer is, again, there's no one silver bullet solution to this, and therefore there's also no one place that you're going to want to put those R&D dollars. We need to look at... I, I personally feel that we need to be looking at a diverse range of solutions. Let's not put all our eggs in one basket. You know, let's not pick a winner. Let's actually look at multiple different avenues that we should be um, pursuing for some of the solutions, because we're going to need multiple solutions rather than one overall solution. But certainly the research and development side of this is really important. Anybody else would like to make a comment on that? I'd just like to make the point about investment overall. Agriculture has been so ignored by policymakers and governments all over the world, but particularly in, in many parts of the, the global south. So re sort of invigorating the investment in agriculture which will lead to a lot of i think interesting solutions you'll have more youth involved in agriculture if there are more opportunities you'll have more women getting the resources that they need you'll have more opportunities for farmers to mobilize because they know that their governments think they're worthy and and you know think they're valuable so you know one of the the things that has has declined substantially a across the globe is extension services. The people who go out into fields with farmers and, and help them do their jobs better with you know, new data or new advice or you know, help them solve a problem like a, a crop disease or, or a, a livestock disease. Those services have declined, you know, from you know, in the United States to almost all of Sub-Saharan Africa, and been replaced by agribusiness. So there's a real need and an opportunity for governments to again create jobs by investing in in agriculture through extension. That's a really important point, actually. If I can just um, add to that. So in the whole of the greater Melbourne area, if we should go sort of 100 kilometres outside Melbourne, we have only two agricultural extension officers in two local governments. The rest of them have no agricultural extension officers at all. This is something that's been largely privatised. And if we want to support farmers to be adapting, then we need to put those extension officers back out, and, and we need more government support for those officers. Great, thank you. The next question is around um, the leading leading countries, or or where should we look to for inspiration for for best practice? Um, I'd be interested to hear about leading countries, but also to go one level deeper, maybe about some leading companies who are really pushing the boundaries uh, on on what's possible. Um, it depends. Um, from a regulatory perspective, you just ask what the scandos would do. The Norwegians, the French, uh, the Europeans are far, far ahead, or states like California. Um, from a business perspective, uh, we can look further up the agricultural supply chain and looking into the retail supply chain at companies like Unilever, for example, 
um, and purpose-driven corporations like Ben and Jerry's who um, are embedding issues not only in relation to climate change but um, sustainability more broadly into everything they do. Um, and it, as an indication of how quickly this is shifting, um, listening to Paul Pullman, who's the former CEO of Unilever speak uh, this time last year, where he was saying the previous year he'd had a meeting with his general managers about his idea to target 2025 as the date uh, at which all their uh, plastics, all their packaging would be recyclable. And all his general managers said, oh, that's too hard, we're going to lose a truckload of money and what do you mean, that's so ambitious, blah, blah, blah. Within six months, they'd come back to him and saying, to say, we've got to do it quicker. It's not enough. So I think that it, it's difficult to point to individual companies who've got it because no one's got it. Um, Particularly in the ag sector, I'd look at wineries because they have been onto this for years. Brown Brothers, for example, is, is very advanced. Um, but other than that, from a policy perspective, you look at the scandos. So let's, um, let's dig into Brown Brothers just one step deeper. What do you think is different about their organisation and not necessarily about what they do, but what, what do you think is uh, inspiring them to take that next step and actually take action? Yeah, and again, I mean, Brown Brothers, they're 160 years old. It's a family business. They're intergenerational. They've got handwritten records of temperature observations on their properties that go back to the 19th century, that, you know, that take observations every hour on things like rainfall and temperature and humidity and all that kind of thing. And they stopped having the debate about whether or not climate change was a real thing 30, 40 years ago because they could see the impact it was having on their crops. Um, and, and in the winery sector now, there is the, the, um, the fruiting season has become so compressed that, um, you know, the, the, the whites are being harvested a lot later and, and the reds are being harvested a lot earlier and so they've now got this really, really narrow window. They're having to move to Tasmania. The French champagne producers are moving to England, which, you know, that is just the sign <laughs> that something is, is awash. Um, their crops are sensitive to, you know, half, half a centigrade difference. So if, if the wineries are, are almost like the canary in the coal mine, I think, for the agricultural sector more broadly in that regard. Yeah, great. So I think we've probably got time for one more question. Um, so, yeah, the next question, um, I'll just read it out. It's quite a good one. Um, we've got a number of solutions, albeit uh, disparately um, already developed, and oftentimes the breakdown is in applying these solutions. Um, in academic terms, I think this is... Uh, I think of this space as implementation science. How do we bridge the gap? Just start anywhere. There is no silver bullet. You just got to, whatever out of the whole suite that's available to you, jump onto something and start, because that's always a harder step. We found, you know, in Australia, farmers tend to be older, and many of them actually haven't done education, formal education on agriculture for quite a while. So where they get the knowledge um, is through talking to other farmers and having that conversation, you know, over the paddock fence with your neighbours. There's a lot of really strong land care groups still in Australia where there's a lot of knowledge sharing and case studies. We've um, got a section on our website, Farmers for Climate Action, that has a Climate Smart Agriculture Toolkit and some case studies up there. But we are finding that there is so much demand from Australian farmers to know what, what is the best practice. And obviously, because it varies so much from, you know, different commodities, different industries, and geographically what you're going to be doing in Tassie is so different from what you're doing in Western Queensland, um, there is definitely a need for more, for more research that is really tailored to different agricultural regions. And then, yeah, as many conversations and, and forums and certainly that issue with all the extension services being cut, that is one that our farmers raise with us all the time um, is that there just is a shocking lack of extension out there. So I reckon that's where you probably start is campaigning to get um, 
you know, in, from a policy perspective, more funding for extension. From a grassroots perspective, we hold these climate risk in agriculture um, conferences where farmers come along and learn information and sharing case studies. And there's a lot of conversation happening on social media with Australian farmers on Twitter and Facebook. There's a lot of knowledge sharing there. I'll be quick. I, I also think it's important to remember in this discussion about climate disruption that the, the innovations and solutions that we've talked about on this panel are good for not just disrupting climate change, but for improving biodiversity, for improving gender equity, for you know restoring uh, soils, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not just about climate. It, it, you know, agriculture is very holistic, and we need to remember that the solutions that, that will help climate change will also help uh, farmers themselves. Absolutely. I think that's a, a great message to leave it on. Could you please put your hands together for this fantastic panel? Anna Rose from Farmers for Climate Action, Daniel Nirenberg from Food Tank, Sarah Barker from Minter Elson Lawyers, and Dr. Rachel Carey from Melbourne University. Thank you.